Hello everyone and welcome to part, well part five, section C. The final part of this scenario which is about what would probably happen if the Axis powers decided to get in a war. Um, as you notice it has sort of continued on to some of the ideas about what kind of aircraft and ship you could see because the interesting thing is January 1939, Singtao is one of those points where a whole maelstrom of different worlds can appear. Very, very similar to the one we're in now, but have been just that bit different because a lots of those, what we already know, would, would produce quite good aircraft. For example, the Sea Fury. Sea Fury doesn't come into service till late in uh, late World War Two, end of you know after the war's over, pretty much. And a lot of similar things with the Barracuda and these things. And mostly that's because of the very sensible prioritization of land-based aircraft for the Battle of Britain. And then the various battles going on in North Africa and Europe. Because by the time we, we started building up the fleet air arm and building up that and really thinking about that, we were importing them from America. So yes, we did end up using variations of the Spitfire, etc. But that's after the Spitfire is being changed to Seafire because honestly, the Spitfire is being taken out of service. It's become it's no longer the frontline fighter it was. Yes, it's still very good, but there are Typhoon, there's Tempest, there's all sorts of other things there. So the point is, and this is a route which is taken because of the very sensible needs of the time this war though was saying well it begins in the far east and that's going to change some of the balances it's going to make it a more of a naval war from the beginning which means whilst you will expect especially with the fleet going out to the east i would expect a lot of money to be given to the air force royal air force to defend the uk i would expect fighters and bombers to be going up in number but I'd also expect there not to be quite as dramatic an increase between January and September 1939 in the land-based aircraft as there had been, as some of those facilities get focused on, well, possibly there might be, because it's going to be with the war conditions, so it might be closer to what you have in terms of production increases between September and June 1940. Alter and especially as you have the advantage that there's going to be no risk of them being bombed, of those factories being bombed, of the facilities being bombed, so you can basically build unfettered. But it's an interesting idea to think of. Anyway, enough of me prattling. Let's go to me and Daniel prattling. <sighs> oh. You're German and you're Italian and you're suddenly starting to, to destabilise, and obviously you're going to have deliveries going to both the Britain in the UK and to Singapore because you're going to need some of those supplies to equip the forces you're forming up and training, get them used to the equipment before they get when they leave Britain. Mm. Now, if I'm German and I am planning a big war versus Britain, one of the first things I want to take out has got to be those supply convoys. They become my almost for me the version of the. The Spanish gold convoys. I've mm. got to stop them somehow. Yeah. And if America's being benevolent but neutral, I might well decide that it's better to attack them than to attack the British and the French because it, it'll probably scare them. Because my theory is, remember, if they're not already in the war versus Japan, they don't want to go to war. They're scared yeah. of war. Mm. And because I've just taken the Romanian oil fields, I suddenly don't feel I need and I'm on good terms with the Russians who also make oil mm -hmm. and I've now got access all the way down the Danube but I've got to worry about the Russians a bit because in the nicest way they're fighting alongside the Allies in the Far East yeah. and if I go to war against if I go to war against the Allies I might well lose the, uh, not have the Russian support I want or the Russian trade I want because the, the Russians might go in the nicest way we're fighting alongside them. They're again sending us troops. Yeah, but the Germans are short-term thinkers. Yeah. And at the, moment, at the moment, they don't need. 
And rather than going east into Poland as kind of their early moves, they've gone south. Yeah. So actually what they might be thinking is I'm going to try and take the north, the, the Black Sea and get over to Georgia and Baku and all of those and get to the oil ahead of going for Moscow and things. Mm. Which would have been a far more sensible thing, uh, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and the Soviets do not have much of a navy, and I don't think they're going to have much of a navy in uh, the Black Sea. So actually, you don't need to get too much across there to be taking them on, or you can just invade round the land side. It depends your... how friendly Bulgaria is prepared to be to you. Mm. Well, you've just given them nice chunks of Romania, so... Yes, and you could give them nice chunks of a navy. So mm. it's your, not your navy forming up there, it's the Bulgarian navy. Yes. Um... That's a good way to get rid of your panzer sheeps. And mm. you, but an actual place where they could actually be useful, because let's be honest, the Black Sea is perfect for a panzer sheaf. Yes. Far away from anything which might kill it. Yes. And nothing else there's going to have an 11-inch gun. Mm -hmm. Barely anything's going to have the 6-inch guns. They've got a secondaries. Um, and you don't need to overtax the engines with long cruises. No. Which are the unreliable diesels. Yeah. Mm. Black Sea, the perfect theatre of operation for the Deutschland class. Wow. We've not necessarily found a use for them, but we found a place where they're less useless. Yes. <gasps> it's amazing. The, the. Yeah, that's kind of a shocking experience. I think I'm almost going to send to say that on that shock, we should probably end this particular, you know, one yeah. bigot scenario because we have now managed to shock ourselves to the point of We've got almost the Italians no doing well in North Africa. Yeah. We've got the Deutschland class having a function. Yes. Um... And we're busily trying to play um, uh, kind of, oh, I'm trying to think what the right word is. It's sort of, we're swap, hot swapping the different turrets around the different British cruiser classes. Yes, we, we, are, we have been working as, I will leave in for this, the working out on how to try and figure out a better, uh, to better make better cruisers for the Royal Navy. Because we share a, a, a distrust for the viability of the Dido's. They're yep. very good for anti-destroyers. If you're dealing with small ships, they will shred them up. And AA, excellent. But honestly, I could do that with some heavily 4.5-inch armed e e Cs, Ds, and Es. Yeah. You can do it in diff with different hulls. And with the bigger hulls... I mean, the problem is the hulls that Britain, that the Royal Navy is making after the town class, are too small. They're just too Because small. they are looking at the treaty limits and going, we have to get within the treaty limits. Yes. Which is a real pity that they committed to this, given that the first of the... But I have a feeling, again, that there is a difference in the scenario, because you have to remember what gets built versus what doesn't get built is very much a reflective of the war that's being fought. Mm. Britain is fighting a war, a convoy war in the Atlantic. That is why battleships, cruisers, aircraft carriers all get delayed at the beginning of World War II. Under these scenarios, Britain is starting off fighting a Pacific war, where mm. it is going to need battleships, aircraft carriers, cruisers, long-range destroyers. Mm. So all those things are going to get built yeah. rather rapidly. Instead mm -hmm. of them being stalled for a couple of years, they're going to have those programs accelerated as much as Britain can. Yeah. The, qu the other question is how many of if you if you've ditched the treaties a bit earlier, yeah, and you're suddenly looking at battleships being more of a thing. Which of the King George the Fifths do you break out the plans to reequip to have them with 15 inch guns? I can't do much about KGV or... Prince of Wales. Prince of Wales. Duke but... of York is number three. Can't do much with her either. Possibly Anson and Howe. Mm. 
That could be quite interesting. Yeah. Um, the other thing is I'm going to be accelerating my fleet carrier program, so yeah. expect illustrious, uh, uh, illustrious, indo- uh, formidable, victorious, indomitable to be completed to tweet. Um, uh, indefatigable, yes, probably very quickly. Oof. As quickly as I can get those aircraft carriers into service, I'm going to want those carriers into service. Yeah. And then, what carrier aircraft are you going to go for? Well, I have this lovely little thing being produced for me by um, R.J. Mitchell, who is actually producing a very interesting gull-winged version, sort of Spitfire-like aircraft the Merlin engine as a single seat fighter for me. It's well armed, it's well equipped, and it has folding wings as well as gull wings. So, um, yeah, and it will fit in most of my lifts. So, yeah, I'll take that, please. Uh, let's be honest, the fairy albacore is probably as disappointing as ever, but if I'm doing a beginning of the war, it's going to be fairy swordfish, and they're blooming good at night strikes, so bye-bye Japanese Navy. Yeah, there also is a much money. Um, but longer term, I'm probably going to find myself skipping the um, albacore for the barracuda, or modifying the albacore to the point to which it makes no difference. Now, the other, the other thought is when the British Purchasing Commission went to North America in fairly early in 1940 i think it was yeah and said can you build our planes they went give us six give us you know very short amount of time and they built and they designed the mustang Mm -hmm. so if we've changed that and we say we want a carrier fighter we you see the reason we need a carrier fighter from the americans isn't because we're not designing good carrier fighters ourselves It's Mm. because we can't produce them because we're prioritizing producing for the Battle of Britain. Yeah. So the thing is, if you're not fighting the Battle of Britain, we've got some perfectly good designs coming through of our own. What is interesting, therefore, though, and this might sound strange, is you start prioritizing the naval fighters for building them, and they're being prioritized. Maybe you're getting a few Battle of Britain ones through, but not many. For the RAF, for the UK, and these sort of things, probably it's probably more 50-50 split, so they're not getting the overwhelming provenance they need. If you start seeing Germany, uh, Germany and Italy looking antsy, do you go and then make that request to the Americans again and get the Mustang again, and the Mustang becomes part of the Battle of Britain? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It I think I might have just overloaded Daniel's mind then. Yeah. I'm also just having a look at um, what the Americans were kind of doing and potentially capable of doing. Because um, they did have the Pratt & Whitney R2800 double wasp. Yep. The prototype of the thing that would turn into the Vought Corsair, which I do love. Yeah. But um, you would have the... Um... Was flown C-fang. in. Was you flown would have the you would have the supermarine sea fang to love. True. The gull wing sea uh, spitfire, the sea fang, I think it was called. Yeah. And. And let's be honest, anything that's sort of got, got gull wings and does the folding thing like that, so it's just going on. It's just going to look cool because it just goes. Mm. I'm now coming to kill you. Yeah. I am sleep. Kill time. Yeah, I just think it's going to be, um, yeah, so I can see the Corsair coming along. Um, you've got the, what will become the Wildcat, but you've got the uh, the Brewster Buffalo. Yeah, Here's a big one. The Buffalo was not a bad aircraft for its time. It beat the, bu- remember, it did beat the Wildcat. And then they went away, worked on the Wildcat, and that came back even better. 
Uh, I'm in the Wildcat, according to Wikipedia. First flight, 1937. Yep. It was atrocious. Hmm. Um, but it improved quickly. Yeah. But, uh, they had a decent one by the looks like February 1940. Yep. Um, yeah. So the early Brewster Buffalo. So yeah. probably by the time we have beaten up the Japanese Navy, imposing a blockade on Japan. Not sure how long that will last for to actually get Japan because of the sheer numbers, unless they manage to pull off a massive, massive surprise, which is always an option, but they, and that's same but then that's, they, they've gone, which means you're now in the war versus Italy and Germany, if that's, a, if they've taken, and that's a different, that's a sort of, it, it's a kind of reverse of the World War Two in that Japan's been taken out first, and was fixated first, and now it's focusing on Yeah, you basically ends up with a Pacific first strategy. Mm-hmm. And of course, you'll now have Ernie King pushing for an Atlantic first strategy because whatever, whatever the Royal Navy wants, he wants the opposite. Um, no, he wants a Pacific first strategy because he wants to. He sees it as the American strat area, and he sees the Atlantic as the British, and he thinks the British should just deal with the Atlantic themselves. Um, to an extent. He also doesn't want to be second in command to the British. So the trouble is, though, in any scenario, if the British have already won the the big battle versus the Japanese, mm. and if the Americans didn't take part in that, but are now being suckered into the war against in Europe, which is specifically they don't want, but it's a uh, thing, yeah. then he's got a problem in that the victorious British fleet will have come back from Japan, they will possibly have fought a battle in the Mediterranean because if I was, in the nicest way, if if I was the admiral in charge of the Royal Navy at this point, I would fight the war against the Japanese. If I've won the big battle and I've managed to push them into harbour, I would want some carriers to attack any of their naval ships under production in the shipyards. I would literally be gunning for all their shipyards, dockyards, every single ship on in production, I'd be wanting to put bombs and torpedoes into wherever it was. But then, so I keep some carriers in it. I keep a small battle group of battleships around there in case they do manage to actually get something out of the out into this ocean. Yeah. But mostly, I'm going to be using cruisers and submarines as my enforcement tools again for the blockade, aren't I? Yeah. So then I bring my most of my battle fleet and probably most of my carriers back with me. Now, I take them into, probably I refit them in Colombo, in, you know, wherever I can in the Indian Ocean. Make sure they're refitted, make sure they're happy. Send some uh, to Simon's Town? Possibly, but that's taken a bit far from where I want them to go. Because what I want to do is I want to come up, I will want to position myself and come straight up and come straight through the Suez Canal as fast as I can go. Yeah. So I appear in the Eastern Mediterranean like Bunda has returned. There is suddenly the full Royal Navy here. If there's anything that if the British existing forces that in the in the Mediterranean haven't managed to contain or successfully control the Italians, but they have managed to keep protect the Alexandria and the Suez Canal, which the British would have sent a lot of troops to do and done its yeah. level best to do. And suddenly the, the Italian the Navy the, suddenly the Italian Navy yeah. has got to deal with this Armageddon coming to it, coming for it. And they will adopt the same policy they adopted later. There will be carrier strikes and any bombers available will be attacking them in base. So they have to come out to sea. Well, that's yeah. the idea. Or taking them out in sea. They'll come out. They'll find a far larger fleet than they're prepared for. And that'll smash them up. Yeah. And yes, the British will probably take some casualties from aircraft. But again... They've had several months versus the Japanese to, do, to find out the faults in the high angle control system and all this thing in a scenario which did benefit them. So mm. now they're in a scenario where it all works and mm. it's going through and it's, it's as working as it could. They've probably got radar online, all these things. Yeah, you, it, the, the Italians are going to not enjoy that scenario because they're not going to have massively increased their managed to massively increase their fleet. 
Mm. because you think by that point, even if they have done a crash building program or tried to get as much to build, it's not going to be anywhere near it can take on the full force which can come back. Nice. And now that fleet can now go proceed down the Mediterranean quite happily after dealing with the Italians, link up with whatever French and British heavy units are in there that aren't needed anymore afterwards, and that's suddenly in the North Atlantic. And that's facing off against the Germans. Now, going in to attack the Germans might not be a good idea, but if you've got, if suddenly the Americans join the battle of the war, well, they've got to deal with a scenario that they're going to be the second fiddle. Yeah. Because there is this big fleet which has just won a bit of two major battles. It's going to have a lot of war experience commanders in it. Mm. A lot of very uh, battle-hardened commanders already experienced naval losses but battle hardened uh, by the scenario at what point is britain going to turn around and go you know what america you're supply you're going to supply a lot of ships in a few years because you're going to start your building program and we're going to concede command of the sea no mm -hmm. so suddenly america has world war ii with no massive sea battles yeah just think what that does to the you know the u.s navy those sea battles are the U.S. Navy's foundation myth. They're also not going to lose a load of battleships and, and, and have that decisive shift to carrier focus and carrier strike. Which might have a very interesting impact for us long term. But there again, the Royal Navy has probably just wiped out quite large chunks of the Japanese and Italian Navy using carrier strikes. So carrier aircraft are probably, uh, carriers are probably getting a lot of respect right at this point. But the... RN fleet air arm was particularly using them at night. Yeah, and sneaky things. So you're not looking at these huge uh, air armadas, daytime daylight bombing. No, that whole thing doesn't get the the um, daylight hours. The carriers are air defence at sea. Nighttime, they're and strong. recce. Yeah, and recce. Oh, one other thing, just going back, I was just looking at the Brewster Buffalo. Yeah. Because I'm just remembering that, of course, that's not going up against the A6M0. That's no. going up against the A5 and maybe even the A4. Yeah. And it's a better aircraft than the A5. Yes. I mean, it will wipe the floor with the A4. Yep. And it'll actually do the same thing to the Italians, I'd imagine, at this stage. I don't know where oh, the Italians are up to. Uh, the Maraki A5 or the A6? Uh, the Italian air fighters, I'm trying to remember now. Hmm. But uh, they are going to be struggling. I mean, again, they, they weren't hugely uh, brilliant in the uh, Second World War. No. Um, I'm not entirely convinced they were doing brilliantly. Um, so I don't know quite how uh, good things would have been at this point. Um, once again, I'm afraid I'm just for, for speed. I am looking at uh, the uh, media. Yeah. Um, but... Um, yeah, it may not go all that well for them, is what I'm thinking. Um, so they've got things like a Breda 88, uh, Lynx, Lynche. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bomber. It's got... Three two hundred kilo bombs. That's a bomber. Yep. Oh, ground stack aircraft. Wow. I'm terrified. They have the they've got a small number of the Caproni AP one. Uh which not again, it can carry a five hundred kilo bomb. Mm -hmm. uh, fairly slowly, I think. Yeah, very slowly. Um, they've got, uh, yeah. I just, I, I don't 
feel that the Italian Air Force is going to enjoy coming up against the RN's battle-hardened fleet, bearing in mind to the extent to which the Royal Navy was actually built with Mediterranean operations in mind. Mm -hmm. So armoured carry, armoured flight decks um, and things like that to mean that you can take a 500 kilo bomb and say you take a 500 pound bomb hit you know, you're n they're not going to be taking things out very easily they're going to be coming up against a wall of flak it's just going to be unpleasant isn't it Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's kind of it might actually be quite fun <laughs> in a sort of uh, Marianas um, turkey shoot way. Um, it would be certainly very interesting in terms of what happened to the Italians, because they would try. They would certainly fight well, but again, yeah, I, yeah. yeah the trouble are... is, it's, it's, it's this, the fact that the British, uh, the Royal Navy by this point would have had against a comparatively well fought out fleet and well trained fleet, mm. although not quite as technologically advanced they would look in 1941 in comparison. They would be fighting a fight, uh, fighting a fight, which they could have been prepared for, had trained for, and fought already. Yeah. So they would have that confidence. These are ships which have already been through what would have been a fairly massive battle. Mm. Even if the British had caught the Japanese at night, which is what they wanted to do with their airstrike, and had managed to cripple them or damaged enough of their aircraft and things, it would have still been a fairly big battle. Whether it would have been a Jutland-style engagement, I'm not sure. I think it would have been a far more... I think if they'd hit them at night, I think the Japanese would have tried to run away. I think it would have been a running engagement, more like Matapan. And I think it would have been freaking uh, lethal for anyone to be involved. But it would definitely have given British a lot of confidence. You see... I find myself wondering whether the Britain is going to have learnt from Jutland and so is going to be attriting the Japanese forces heavily. Yeah. But I wonder if the Japanese would actually push on despite the attrition. I'm not sure. This is the thing. I, I can't see the Japanese fleet going home without having fired their guns. Okay. I can accept that, and I think you're probably right. I, I, I just think it's the combination Especially of, at the beginning of the war. It's early in the war. Um, they've got pride at stake. Mm -hmm. And this is Japanese pride, Japanese military pride, mm -hmm. um, rather than um, even the sort of potentially slightly more common sense things. And also things aren't going to get better for them. They've got not got anything else really to be coming online soon. So actually even geostrategically, their best bet is to try and hammer the Allied force early and then just keep playing whack-a-mole. Do you not agree? I do agree. Um, I'm sorry, there are the two things I was just flicking through because I was thinking about what was going on and the, well, I'll talk about the E-Class cruisers earlier and what they were getting up to. And um, someone has written this on Wikipedia. Uh, from 3rd to 29th of February 1944, Enterprise was docked at Devonport for refit and from the 27th to 31st of March, she was fitted for missile jamming gear at Devonport. Mm. Missile jamming gear in 1944. The Fritz X. Yes, but I don't think we'd have called that missile jamming gear. <laughs> no, no, I think it's <laughs> called something else. Um, yeah. 
of course, the one thing which I've noticed about this war mm -hmm. is that it kicks off and looks like it's going to take a while, whilst Reginald Henderson is still third Sea Lord. Yeah. So all those nice changes we want to do, we can hand wave through as being Reginald Henderson doing. Yeah, that is the thing. That it, so if it's a good idea, plan it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, he's still around, he's still fine, and you've cured him, of course. That's yes. the other thing, that's also more change the history we've made. He, 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 he doesn't die, so mm. he ends up going out to Singapore and somehow getting involved in the war. Yeah. Because um, he'd been promoted to full admiral in 39, January yeah. 39. So, um, yeah, so he's suddenly, and I mean... He will have, I am sure, had plans running in secret in parallel to do things like re-equip um, the ships that were grossly constrained by treaty to be slightly less rubbish, won't he? Oh, he had all sorts of ideas running. He had plans. It, you know, it's one of the interesting things when you're looking at the C, D and E classes. Some, most of the ideas for how they improved later in the war were ideas which had already been conceived quite early on. Mm. It's why I'm not. Uh, why whenever I sort of people go, oh, why aren't you doing uh, arming your e uh, your C uh, D class with uh, double six inches or this or that? I go, well, no, the plans were for double four point fives. When did they have the plans? The plans were actually being worked on in 1939, yeah. 1938, and 1939. So those plans existed. Mm. So then when I, we talk about, you know, this is the thing when we're talking. About, the one interesting one is the E class. And that one I haven't been able to find the plans for or what their ideas were about what the fleet could have been. Mm. But my sincere suspicion is that the E-Class HMS Exeter, Enter not Enter Exeter HMS Enterprise has a double six-inch Leander-style turret. She's the test bed for it. Yeah. So they can know they can take a double six. Mm -hmm. So I think if they had the time and if they thought it was going to be a cruiser war rather than an escort war, I have a feeling you would have had both her and Esmer Emerald end up with two double six-inch turrets. So they have four. So, and I wouldn't be surprised if their remainder of their mounts were replaced by three, possibly four double 4.5-inch guns. To give them an all-round firepower. So they would be something which could really cause you a lot of trouble if you're trying to fight them. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're, if they're talking, and this would be sort of the thing you need if you're dealing with surface raiders. And if you were escorting and dealing with anti-air defense, that's a fairly good mixture for them to have had. Because, that, yes, they lose three yeah. of their six-inch guns, but they gain... Six four point five inch guns yeah. sort of makes up for it, and they can take a lot of quadruple AA, a quadruple AA or quadruple two pounders pom pom. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the uh, the the. I'm just trying to think what the. Um... I mean, the only having two turrets isn't necessarily ideal from a having to from a point of view of peacetime construction is not what you'd want to do but if you're doing wartime modifications to turn these ships from being okay-ish mm. third line light cruisers to being okay-ish second line light cruisers which you don't mind not only escorting convoys, but maybe getting somewhere remotely close to the war zone. Yeah, I mean, that's the they thing. do it. They 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 can have a couple of very good roles. Yeah. Because if you're escorting a convoy and you're a surface, you're a German surface raider. Mm -hmm. You're a, you're you're the Deutschland class that was kept by Germany rather than being given to the Hungarians. Yeah. Bulgarian, sorry. Um, for use in the Black Sea. 
You don't want. Honestly, to have we, we we really they should have given the the, the the Bulgarians two, three, all of them, every Deutschland ever. It's the only the scenario plans. where they have yeah. the plans, have the machine tool bits, <laughs> everything. Have our, have our collection of spare bits. <laughs> have have all the crew who ever touched them. Just get take them, take yeah. everything. Um. Oh. But, yeah, because. Okay, it's two six. It's it's only four six inch guns, but you don't want to be being hit by six inch shells because there's yeah for the Germans that's also an advantage because that means Captain Langsdorf gets a Scharnhorst or a Neiser now, and that's a good 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 swap for you guys for the yeah. Germans. Yeah, him working with um, what's his name, the guy who commanded Bismarck. Hola. Luchens? Yes. No. Yeah. yeah. I got to like him. I read up about him. Not not very Nazi-ish. Um, despite, despite the uh, portrayal in Sink the Bismarck. Um, telling Hitler he thought he was wrong to his face in about 38 or 39. That takes guts. Yeah. <laughs> um... Yeah. Or hubris, one or the other. I think in his case it was guts, and actually, yeah. he 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 seemed to actually stick with those things. So, um, yeah. But I think going along this scenario, uh, you know, we've got the Germans tying along. We've got, we've got quite far away from them now because, honestly, you're now dealing with a land war, and that's the trouble with the Japanese because they're an island nation. You can keep it to a maritime blockade. If you're dealing with the Germans and the Italians, do the Germans also invade Poland? If they do invade Poland and they haven't got the Soviet Union's on side, the Soviet Union might well invade Poland back. But again, the Soviet Union's been upping its military, already dealing with the Japanese, a lot of Allied support, a lot of technology going in, probably helping them out. They already had good technology themselves. The Soviet army, which you end up dealing with, maybe when you eventually attack Poland, which might well be in November, December, if you're really stupid, probably save it for February 1940, is yeah. going to be very different after they've been involved in a big war for mm. going on to nearly two years with mm. Allied support for a long time that, than the army you face. Yeah. You've suddenly got a, you've suddenly got the, a red army that is almost the opposite of the the real world one, which had been sort of because it, it fought Kalkin goal, yeah, and okay, it won that, but then it managed to eviscerate itself against the Finns in the Winter War thirty nine forty, didn't it? Yeah. Which probably doesn't happen under this scenario. Won't do that because no. it's fighting other people, and that would monumentally tick off the uh, your allies. Yes. In Europe, and it would also, I think that was, I think that was a product of the agreements about division of Eastern Europe between Germany and the Soviet Union that led to the invasion of Poland. I think it was this kind of idea of spheres of influence that they yeah. had so the only the reason that they did it was part of the whole invading poland and dissecting poland as well so that if that's not happening yeah they've not eviscerated themselves there and also which, must remember the germans have used a lot of ground troops to get to romania yeah they're not efficient they do take a lot of losses they've got um they're going to struggle you might well have an ongoing war in Yugoslavia. Yeah. Yeah, the Italians aren't going to be doing well there. So the Germans might well have had to go and join them. Um, well, I mean, that's a good question, because actually you've got that river... Uh, uh, you've got the, that major river as your yeah. almost entire border protecting that side. And I did write down the name, and I did... Uh, the river... Rather. Mm -hmm. The so same the, river which, from memory, caused the Romans a lot of trouble. Yes, I think so. So, I mean, I really... I'm not sure how easy the Germans are going to find crossing that river. 
oh, it's going to be terrible, but that means they're either going to have to send their supplies through the Italian lines, or they're going to have to try and build a crossing. I mean, they can they can join the Italians attacking from the north. And if they're friendly with the Bulgarians, they can join the Italians attacking from the south. Mm -hmm. But what they can't necessarily do is attack that whole flank with what will functionally be, it'll be an opposed riverland, river crossing. Mm -hmm. It'll be properly opposed. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think they can do it. Nope. But I think they might try. Because it looks like the perfect solution, doesn't it? It does. Um, the problem to is... A, to a very, you know, to an abstract, to a mind which works things out in exactly precise detail, this is how you precisely do this. Mm. And we will suppress the enemy ability to fire back at us. Yes. With pinpoint actually from our Stukas that actually isn't anywhere near as pinpoint as everyone thinks. Yeah. Because they're pinpoint on the training ground and no one's shooting flak at them in the training grounds. Yeah. And no fighters around either. No. The Stukas do so well against fighters. Actually, the, the, the disturbing thing is when you look at it, I think they actually do less well against fighters than swordfish. Probably. Which is quite disturbing when you think about it, because let's be honest, and I, this is speaking of someone who actually likes and does like to say how good the fairy swordfish was. They just they shouldn't have done half the things they achieved. But the fairy swordfish was a great aircraft because it was partly from another era. It, you know, if you've got a met if you've got a stressed metal skin, yeah. And metal spars and everything, then that's going to be damaged by rifle caliber bullets and it's going to uh, cause the cannon shells to explode on contact. And you're getting probably quite a lot of your, um, and this is where my, the fact, are. so I don't do physics and I don't do maths. Yes. Really. Um, Disturbing enough, this is why we have me in this conversation. Yeah. I'm a medic. Um, yeah, not doing physics and maths as a medic. It sounds quite scary. <laughs> um, I don't... I, I have I have opted for bits that don't involve that. I like complex systems. And okay. Um, the... Uh... I would, in fact, describe myself as a diagnostician. I'm like House without the limp or the opiate addiction. Um, oh, but that makes you actually probably safer to be around, but less interesting somehow. True. Couldn't you I just take the limp? I also have to look after more than one patient at a time, which is a real bugger. Yeah. Um, but the... the um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the strength from the stretched metal skin yeah when that gets ruptured you're actually going to start losing some of the strength of the aircraft whereas the canvas although it's stretched it tears differently yeah it's not going to be weakened as much by a tear by a single tear and it's not going to necessarily trigger the cannon shells oh no that's was half their advantage so a lot of it can just it's almost invisible to a lot yeah. of the wep to weaponry unless you manage to fill it so full of holes or set it on fire. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think now we are going to call uh, an end to this scenario. We do have one more scenario to do, but we might not record it today because looking at the time, I have to prep for this afternoon's live, but also I have to go downstairs and deal with a phone call about the building work we've got around. So I want to say thank you to Daniel because it's been really cool and I'm sure the watchers will have enjoyed it and we will try and organize this the next scenario and the next scenario is the final scenario we've talked about is space bats somehow intervene and the very pro-Nazi 
um, political parties in the American, the fr- America, the fringe ones, managed to become president somehow. And and also the very anti-British. Yes, the sort of the pro the pro Nazi anti germ anti British sort of factions sort of somehow actually stop trying to hurt each other more than they and actually cooperate. Managed to seize power in the United States with the help of space bats. Don't forget the space bats; they're very scary. And therefore, America ends up in this war on the side of Japan. It's going to be interesting. We're going to try and get it recorded before Monday. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. I'll stop the recording. Oh, apologies about that. Managed to catch myself out. Oh, I can remember. Let's pause that. So, I hope you enjoyed it. That was part five, section C. And this proves I shouldn't have been trying to tidy up my little space in preparation for today's brew ships um, whilst doing this. Well, today when I'm editing brew ships. This is of course going out on Monday where it's the live. (laughs) Oh, I'm doing too many of these. I'm loving them, but I'm doing too many. I'm getting confused as which day is which. So, thank you very much to everyone. Um, Please like, share and subscribe if you do. And um, have a nice day. Thank you and hope you've enjoyed it.